Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. My name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Today, we're going to be discussing Bunny by Mona Awad. I have been on a bit of an adventure with this book, so this video is going to be a bit of an adventure as well. Um, let's start off with a little bit of story time, and then we'll get into my critique. So I originally started to film a video for this book as a vlog, and my goal was to have you join me as I analyze this work, um, during which I would share with you my note-taking process, as well as how I approach close reading or reading for analysis. One of the be best performing videos that I have on my channel is how to annotate a book, and I see a lot of people giving, um, vi creating videos like this, looking at their annotation process. Um, but when we're thinking about, you know, how to teach critical thinking, one of the best ways, in my opinion, is to actually model it for people, kind of over and over again, until they can um, start, you know, start asking those deeper questions themselves and looking for textual evidence to just to answer them in the book. And I selected this book because I had seen several creators talk about how if you had a pen in hand while reading this book, like it's ripe for analysis, like there's a ton of textual evidence to analyze, like it's it would be a great book to analyze. They didn't analyze it, but they felt like in the reading experience that if you were to approach the text that way, it would just be like ready for you to kind of do this deeper reading. So I was like, okay, well, I like doing that, so I'll do that. Plus, as you guys know, I love dark academia. I love Kafka-esque weirdness, the weirder the better. So I was like, let's go. This is going to be a great fit. Plus, it's kind of having a moment on the internet. I'm probably actually too late. It's probably already done with its moment, but that's okay as per usual with me. But what ended up happening is like I filmed several hours of footage of, it's just me being confused and like also desperately trying to like make it work and like give the most generous interpretation of what's on the page to try to cobble together a video of what this book could actually mean and how I'm coming to these conclusions. And I'm talking in circles a lot. At the end of the day, <laughs> not a great, book to analyze closely is what my conclusion was and also because of that horrible choice for trying to teach people how to read closely because it's just going to confuse you. Um, I will get into my critique of this book both like my review and my critique of it um, but the, the long story short is that this book does not <laughs> Uh, open itself up to a deeper reading or prime itself for like uh, a close reading or a deeper analysis and there may be a reason for that we will get into like my generous interpretation interpretation of that and then also like what i suspect is actually happening so let's get into this book and like why i feel that way about it so let's start with a summary as always with my analytical videos my content contains spoilers i like to talk about the details of these books and obviously the ending of a book really influences what the book means so I can't do analytical videos without talking about specifically what happens in it. If you don't want to know, you can go ahead and stop watching here. Bunny is set in a fictional East Coast liberal, liberal arts type of college called The Warren. Bunny, Warren, get it? Our main character, Samantha, is in her second year of her Master of Fine Arts in fictional writing, and the story opens with the students at a mixer sort of returning from summer break, and it is clear that Samantha, it, a scholarship student, feels alienated from the other girls in her cohort, and these girls are hyper-feminine, they're wealthy, they're also quite dreamy girls, and they all refer to each other as Bunny. That's the nickname that they give each other. So this is mostly stuff that is on the back of the book, and also much of what I had heard the way that this book was described on the internet. So at this point, I'm kind of thinking, okay, so we have an opportunity to talk about class, as we often do with dark academia. We often have um, this class stratification. We often have a scholarship student versus the wealthy students um, who uh, we have this sense of alienation not being in the in crowns. So it's also about alienation versus connection. And especially I was leaning towards that even more so than necessarily this idea that it might be about class because the fact that Samantha is a scholarship student is less emphasized compared to this 
connected group of women who call themselves bunny, who like hug each other and they spend all their time together and they're sort of like this um, undifferentiatable group. And so I thought it might be making this commentary about individualism versus collectivism. The fact that Samantha feels disconnected, but how much of her personal identity is she willing to give up in order to be part of a community? I thought that was going to be the fundamental question of this book. Pretty quickly, I found, you find out that Samantha already has a great friend named Ava. So then I'm like, okay, now it became a question of if Sam, Samantha is deeply connected in this very rich friendship as described in the book, why would she abandon this connection that she has with Ava for the other girls whom she disdains and whom she, with whom she seemingly has very little in common. But abandon Ava she does when the bunnies invite her to their so-called smut salon. And here the idea that the bunnies are viewed as a conformist collective is undercut by the fact that each of the girls are actually have individual names. We learn those names, we start to refer to them as their individual names. Um, and they also have unique descriptions and styles are given to each girl, unique writing styles are given to each girl and what they're interested in and what they focus on. So the individuality of each of the bunnies really comes to the fore as Samantha gets to know them better. So it's not really about them having this um, uncanny uh, group identity, right? We also in this chapter start to explore sexuality more um, more so kind of on the surface of the story. So on the one hand, we have this sort of highly simplistic and infantilized type of sexual expression that the bunnies sort of represent or sort of choose to exhibit. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a weird paradox in our patriarchal society where you want the ideal of innocence to be really at the forefront while also having someone who's sexually available. And it's weird and I don't like it. But we also have this rich relationship with Eva, which you can see perhaps leaning towards romance or it could just be a really close friendship. And then you also have one of the one of the bunnies is, uh, is a baker and she always makes these delicious confections and cupcakes and things like that. And you start to see Samantha using consumption style language, particularly with her, like she wants to take a bite out of her or she has this, you know, sugary sweet smell to her or whatever. So you, so I was beginning to wonder like, oh, is this also maybe a little bit about Samantha trying to understand some, maybe her same sex attraction to these girls. But the novel re never really investigates that or critiques the like infantilized sexual expression of the bunnies, nor the potential intimacy that Samantha longs for. Um, and instead, what we see with the girls is that they have a very immature and childish way of understanding sexuality and the sort of stories that they're longing for um, Samantha to share with her, them at the smut salon or the sort of things that they conceive of are very high school. And then also in the background of this novel is another relationship, Samantha and the lion. So the lion was their primary professor in the first year of the program and in her reflections on the previous year, it's revealed to us that Samantha developed something of a friendship with the lion outside of the classroom. They spend a lot of time together. They discuss her work, they read other books, they discuss those. And there seems to be a particular night where Samantha insists that nothing happens. And it's a little bit of me think she doth protest too much. And she also really fears the judgment of the bunnies regarding this relationship. She has a lot of guilt about it. And speaking of the sort of sexual immaturity, there's a lot of emotional immaturity on the parts of these characters. And this was probably one of the things that was most difficult for me to accept and wrap my mind around and just choose to go along with. And it's just that Samantha herself is very immature, but also the bunnies are very immature. The whole conflict seems very high school to me. And so I just, I had a hard time believing that Samantha and the bunnies were acting so incongruously to what their ages must be if they're in a master's program. So it's just very harkening back to these high school style of romance, this like, I'm not like other girls, but really wanting to be a part of the popular girl group. Just like it, like, None of it read to me like women who are in their mid to late 20s. The emotional content is very teenager like 15, 16, not 25, 26, not 28, not 30. Like, 
no. And then like, again, the social structure, it just makes more sense in a high school structure, not a college and certainly not a master's program. The social ties that you have when you're in college are just so much looser compared to what you experience in high school. Because in high school, you're forced to spend all your hours with the same people in this highly structured environment in college, you don't necessarily hang out with your fellow students, although you might. You might get to know other graduate students who are also teaching, or you might like wait tables and become friends with the person that you wait tables with. Like there, the community and the in the 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 social circles that you engage with aren't just tied to school anymore. And so there's not necessarily like this elite and structured social class that um, is ubiquitously understood to be such. The desirable people to be with and so it's like then like how can you if you don't have it if you don't have this tight social structure then you don't have this like I idealized in group so then how can you have like this desire to be a part of the in group or a resentment towards the in group like it's just not that structured when you're in college one thing that you will see that is worth perhaps observing is the use of animal language throughout the text. And so obviously we have the animalistic language of the bunnies at Warren University, we have the lion, we have the wolf, we have a lot of animalistic terms that are used to describe different characters or different moments. It adds coherence to the work, but it's not necessarily symbolical of a deeper meaning. And that's all I have to say on that. There's also a lot of literary references, which I started by taking note of them, which again, it's not surprising because these are characters who are in a Master of Fine Arts for creative writing. So lots of characters reference books and authors. Samantha refers to them a lot in her narration as well. And this serves to ground the work in its setting. It makes it believable that these students are English students. But again, I don't see them used to convey a deeper meaning. And one example of this is like, there are a couple of references to Alice in Wonderland, right? Which would be a great uh, work to kind of use symbolically to add a layer of meaning to this novel because you have this, you know, you're going to Wonderland, you're eating little cakes. Like there's this transition to this other world where meaning is things are topsy-turvy, meaning is a little bit twisted and unusual. Right? So you, this Wonderland setting, you also have this connection to bunnies with the white rabbit. But since bunny doesn't have a clear thesis of what it means, then it can't use something else as commentary to contrast or enrich or whatever with that meaning. Like you have to have something there for it to be in conversation with. So this book is kind of like just vibes and so by leaning on Alice in Wonderland the only thing that it can do is also be like see we kind of had the same vibes and you're like cool. <laughs> uh, we also have this this tension between do we have an unreliable narrator or are we entering into a trippy world and this is the second of my two major gripes the first one being the immaturity of the characters, and this one is the second one. I am fine with accepting like, oh, we're going into a trippy world where crazy things happen, and I, expe I accept this as the rules of this universe that I'm going into. Or are we dealing with an unreliable narrator who lives in a realistic universe, one that's basically has the same rules of our own, but she herself is not perceiving reality correctly? I began to suspect that Ava was a figment of Samantha's imagination when she disappeared so completely once Samantha decided to spend time with the Bunnies. But then we have a scene where the Duchess went off and spoke with Ava um, away from Samantha, like within Samantha's view, but not outside of her hearing. And then later, Samantha and the Duchess talked about what that conversation was. So is Ava a figment of Samantha's imagination or does she exist in the world of the novel such that other characters can interact with her? And to effectively straddle this line, to have a character experience unusual things and make them an unreliable narrator, you have to be very precise in your writing. And so if we're supposed to understand that Ava is a figment of Samantha's imagination, it would be better to write Ava as only available to Samantha for interaction. This is kind of like the beautiful mind rule where it's like, oh, you go back and watch your beautiful mind and you realize that the characters who we now understand to be part of his imagination actually don't interact with the world and they don't interact with other characters. 
Now you don't technically have to follow this rule because it's all in Samantha's mind. So Samantha could imagine that Ava is interacting with other people. She could imagine that she's having conversations with others about Ava and they seem to know who she is. But it helps to communicate to the reader that Ava isn't real for the other characters of this world to not be able to interact with them, right? And so it's like, if you want, if your goal is to communicate this idea in a subtle way, you have to you have to be very precise with the writing and the way that the characters who are not real interact with the space and interact with others. So then it because so and then there are other consequences, of course, of having a character who is unreliable, because then we begin to question what parts of Samantha's worldview are legit? What parts of her critiques of the bunnies are legit then? Um, and so there's there's big consequences to bringing that person in. If we're supposed to disdain the bunnies as Samantha does, even while she longs to be included, if we are supposed to want Samantha to be herself, want you know, more herself, retain her individual identity once she's held in their thrall, and we're, and we're longing maybe Ava will come and save her, maybe Ava is a representation of her truer and higher self. Uh, then we also have to come to doubt her view of the bunnies as much as her perception of the real world. So are they really sinister? Are they really childish? Are they really cloyingly sweet? Are they really these sort of sex kittens? Now, like all of that gets called into question. For me, one of the things that I find most offensive about the bunnies is their expression of feminine sexuality as infantilized. But then if I later see that Samantha is an unreliable narrator, I have to ask myself, is this how they choose to express themselves? So I should also be judging them for that in the way that Samantha does? Or is that a projection that Samantha makes onto them and it's not actually about them, it's just what Samantha sees? And none of that becomes clear because it's quite sloppily done. Another big theme in this book is this idea of the body as the work. And so this is sort of like the last theme that I'll cover and then we'll wrap it up. So the body, the bunnies talk about the body as the work. It's one of those phrases that becomes a point of absurdism in the story. And it's a phrase that someone might say to like sound smart, uh, but the bunnies make it literal. So they figure out uh, a bloody way to transform bunnies into their high school fantasy boyfriends, like fantasy Ken dolls, but gone wrong. So they often like aren't able to hold quite a normal conversation or there's some sort of physical deformity that's like not quite right. And then they have to sort of like off these bunnies who have been transformed into pseudo humans also with an ax or like drop them at the edge of town and, and maybe they'll survive, who knows. So there's like this sort of bloody side to what they're engaging in. And that comes along with this idea of like, oh, you have to kill your darlings, blah, blah, blah. Not that that's referenced in the book, but I'm presuming that that's what we're supposed to be thinking of. And this is justified in the story as their ultimate expression of the body as the work. Like they're literally making cre creatures with their creative intent, right? And I think this aspect would have been vastly more effective if they were in like a performance art MFA program as opposed to like a creative writing program. But again, I get it. But also it's like, like I get that you're saying like, oh, the body of the work and they're interpreting it very literally and then they're like creating these bodies and then they have to chop up these bodies. But I'm like, but also like, but beyond that, what does it mean? You see what I'm saying? Like I'm always kind of frustrated by this book because I'm like, it, I feel like it's not as smart as you think it is, or like, are, am I dumb? Am I not getting it? You know, you get into like that whole questioning thing. So let's get to the WTF part of this book, which is like, if you finished reading this book and you're like, oh, WTF, what happened? Here's my interpretation of what happened. So let's go chronologically. In the first year, Samantha struggles to connect with the bunny. She feels like an outsider in the class. She feels their judgment of her work. And they do say her work is too dark. But then they're like, but you're gritty and you like live in the real world. And so we want to see what like your bunnies are like. But at the same time, we also see the descriptions of what their stories are. And they're also very dark. So I'm like, well, what like we have these saccharine sweet, but like none of this is none of this is organized. It's such disorganized book. We have these saccharine sweet bunnies who all refer to each other as bunny except they're supposed to be this group, except they're actually highly individualized. Then they're like, oh, Samantha's too dark. But then like, they're the ones over here with like an ax and chopping things up and they're writing dark, dark stories. So what are they mad at Samantha for? Like, I don't know. Like, why are they like, you know, wanting to like, not mad at Samantha, but wanting to reject Samantha for like, I just, <clears throat> okay. 
part of this is like sort of like, are you down, right? So there's like that, again, that social challenge, like you have to do this thing that you're uncomfortable with to be a part of the in-group. Very high school yet again, like, so is Samantha gonna be down for like the axing of bunnies and the creation of these hybrids and what they do? Because it's obviously alarming. Then there's also the sense that they want her to be, like I said, edgy or gritty. Maybe she's gonna be really good at making hybrids. And of course it's like, because maybe she's a better writer than them and maybe it's all a metaphor for that, but like, we don't need to do all of this to get to a metaphor for that. It's like, so they do not, do they not like her because she's edgy or gritty or is it in Samantha's head or do they actually really like her? Again, the writing is so disorganized and so unclear and so sloppy. I, mm, back to the WTF scenario. Samantha does connect with the lion. So they hang out after class, they go to events together, they read books and share ideas. They're definitely exploring a relationship. Then there's this end of year party and Samantha says nothing happens, but we know we go up to like his office or room during this party. And then the memories are kind of blocked from there, right? And so the next scene that we see is that Samantha walks outside and sits on the bench in front of the pond where there's a swan. And Samantha has a break with reality. And in her mind, one of the swans becomes Ava, her idealized best friend. And the rest from that put forward is sort of her break with reality, right? And this is because something traumatic in the room happened with the lion, presumably some sort of sexual assault happened. And the whole adventure with the bunnies and the hybrids culminates with Samantha creating the wolf. So let's talk about the wolf. He is a better hybrid than any of the bunny based hybrids that the bunnies make. This is because Samantha believes she's a better writer than the bunnies. The wolf is also how she has like revenge. Um, she exhibit, you know, she takes her revenge on the bunnies for whom she has disdain, even at the same time of like admiring them and wanting to be a part of them. So he becomes sort of like this ultimate seducer, right, for each of them and causes them great emotional pain. But he's also a seducer of Ava. So is Ava, again, this representation of her higher self? Is Ava this representation of uh, Samantha's ideal partner, ideal friend, ideal lover? And then she, the wolf itself comes in and has a relationship with her. So she's tormenting herself with her work. What does it mean? Who knows? In the end, Samantha takes the, the ax and chops off the head of the swan or the chops up the swan who is her best friend and that begins to like that's where we should understand like oh here's where reality begins is because Ava is literally a swan so what is this book about freaking nothing no um okay so what do I think this book was meant to be about I think this book was intended to be absurdist. I think it was intended to highlight the way in which art is over intellectualized. And I think the book is written in such a way as to resist a close reading. That's my generous interpretation of this novel. I think that's what it's set out to do. The closer to you get to the book, the closer you read it, the more it falls apart partially because of its absurdism. And the further you step away, the more uh, this one idea becomes clear. I think if you're going to read this and enjoy it, because I do think the experience of reading it is enjoyable if you enjoy trippy books, and it's sort of like, just let it wash over you. Just let it be vibes, vibes only, and, and enjoy like the crazy ride that you're about to go on. But don't think about it too much. Don't try to make sense of it. You'll just get frustrated, either because it's successfully resisting interpretation or... <laughs> because in my opinion, it's extremely sloppily written and it didn't really think that hard about what it was trying to say and it's not that smart. And it's one of those people who like is anti-intellectual that you're having a conversation with. And I'm like, maybe you're just anti-intellectual because you don't enjoy the confrontation to your own self-image that the rest of us have in <laughs> when we sort of put forth smart ideas that you haven't thought about before. So here is where we get into like the review part. Like I still wanted it to be better than what it was. I wanted it to be better executed. I was like down for this book and its concept. The things I didn't like, inclusion of feminine infantilized sexuality as contrasted with predatory sexuality, but without any message. It includes both of these without any messages. And if there is any message, then it's on the side of patriarchy, which I really don't appreciate. The bunnies are condemned for being fem feminine, not for the weirdness that infantilized version of sexuality of womanhood is desirable. The wolf is not condemned for his sexual torture of the bunnies. In fact, it seems to be an expression of Samantha's repressed resentment and attraction to the bunnies. And there's no sense that we should either condemn the wolf or Samantha for it. 
And then of course I found the immaturity of the characters like wholly unbelievable whether in this world or not. And this is a problem that I see with so many books that are coming out right now on that are like do well on the book internet. They are structured just like YA, but the characters are aged up um, and the content is more intense. But so instead of writing about a 25 year old who's in a master's program, we've just taken a high school structure and a character who acts and feels and expresses themselves like a 16 year old and said that they were 25, but you haven't actually written a 25 year old character, okay? This is again, one of my criticisms of Ninth House too, where you're like, you can't just structure your story with the same problems, the same character tropes, the same issues, the same like plot points as a YA novel and age people up and call it a, like an adult novel and include some like sexually explicit content or some violent content and be like, oh, now it's an adult novel. No, you actually have to write characters who are adults. Am I? Okay. I'm getting spicy today. I think that covers everything. I think that's all I have for you today. I think I was a little bit disorganized in this, but hopefully you enjoyed that review. If you would like me to use a different book or story to demonstrate how to read closely, how to approach a text analytically, let me know. I have one in mind that I could do that I think would work well, a short story, and maybe that would be helpful for this format since there's less content to get through. But let's continue the conversation about D Bunny down below. Do you hate my opinions? Am I totally wrong? Uh, is this book actually deep and I just didn't get it? Maybe that's the case. But until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.